As we retell this ancient story, let us remind ourselves of those people around the world who are living this story today, struggling to overthrow oppressive dictators and establish more democratic societies. For was it the night from Pesach on this from all the night here? Sid Topol's parents were both born in Poland when it was part of the Russian Empire and joined a large wave of Jewish immigration from the shtetls to the U.S. in the early 20th century. They first settled in New York's Lower East Side, where as a teenager Sid's mother worked in the needle trade. His parents met in New York, but were drawn to Boston by cousins who were in the fruit and produce business. They married and eventually settled in the Columbia Road area of Dorchester. Sid was born in 1924, the youngest of four siblings. He remembers how the Depression affected his father's business. So my father got in the fruit and products business in uh, post-World War I, okay? And the 20s were very, very prosperous. I mean, people were prosperous. People had money, people had jobs. And my father built up a good, a very good practice and was doing very well. He bought a house. We had a car, he had a truck, and then he bought two houses next door. One was a two-family house and one was a three-decker, so we had three houses. So in the 20s, my father was doing well. But then the 30s came along, and suddenly one-third of the nation was unemployed. And people couldn't pay their bills, they couldn't pay their rent. And so my father was a, was a good guy, a lot of people were on credit. Sid was recognized as an outstanding student and was chosen to attend the prestigious Boston Latin School, the oldest public school in the United States, known for its rigorous curriculum. I got into Latin school, had nothing to do with my family. I think it was my teachers. I, I was a good student in grammar school. I, I, I actually got a double promotion. I mean, I skipped the fifth grade. I went from the fourth to the sixth grade. In those days, I mean, there was no mentoring, no discussion. You either passed or you failed, and if you failed, you were out. And I think only one-third of the kids who started Latin school got through. In its early incarnations, Boston Latin was exclusively the domain of Boston's elite, but by the 1930s, the ethnic makeup of the school was transformed. It was originally a very uh, Brahmin, Yankees, they, by the time I got there, had all moved to Weston and Dover. So when I got there, it was Eurocentric. A lot, a lot of Irish Catholic kids, a lot of Italian kids, and a lot of Jewish kids. Very few blacks, very, very few blacks when I was there. Very few Hispanics. Uh, but it was kids from uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, and uh, we got along fine. Sid's time at Boston Latin was formative. The rigorous curriculum instilled in him the traits of timeliness and attention to detail that would stay with him throughout his life. For college, Sid decided to leave Boston for Amherst and the University of Massachusetts. My attraction was uh, I had this idea I'd like to live away from home, you know. Most, most of my colleagues were, like we commuted to high school, they commuted to Harvard or Tufts or BU or BC and, and lived at home. I, I was fascinated with the idea of, of uh, living away from home. At UMass, Sid planned to study chemistry, but a pivotal historic moment forever altered the direction of his life. Uh, I arrived at, uh, at Mass State College in September of 41 a 16-year-old kid that just graduated Boston Latin School. And December 7th of 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Sam Glass and I were playing ping pong in the basement of Lewis Hall, and we had the radio on for some reason, Sunday morning, and we hear about it. I mean, it was a real shocker. And so I, decided, I, I thought about, you know, what am I going to do? And I heard about this... Uh, meteorology program, and uh, I applied, I think it was in Chicago, 
and uh, uh, got accepted. Sid was inducted into the Army in 1943 and underwent an intensive two-year training at Michigan, Yale, Harvard, and MIT to become a radar officer. He clamored to see action and was sent to Japan, where he witnessed the post-war devastation in Tokyo. Yeah, it got, got to Tokyo, burned to the ground, burned to the ground. Three buildings, the Daiichi building where MacArthur was, the Imperial Hotel designed by Frank Lloyd Wright to withstand earthquakes, and a building called the Tokyo Electric Building, which just happened to be an office building that was built fairly strong. The occupation which I was involved in from probably October and November of 1945 to June of 1946, about seven or eight months, was just an interesting experience of taking a country that had centuries of militaristic and autocratic an undemocratic uh, culture was being converted to a democracy. The Japan experience had a long-lasting impact on Sid and influenced his future work in nonviolence. I had a strong military training and background and, and, and mindset in the days of fascism, in the days of Stalinism. And uh, slowly over the years, uh, me, like a lot of other people, realized that we're not, we're not accomplishing anything with wars. Vietnam War particularly was a disaster. And the Iraq War, pretty bad. And even these Gaza Wars, I mean, you know, having to... And I started to learn that Diplomacy and nonviolence have had some successes. Gandhi in England, he threw off the yoke of British colonialism. Mandela in South Africa, a man who started out being fairly violent, came out of prison and ended apartheid. But particularly Martin Luther King, John Lewis getting beaten brutally over the head and not fighting back, the kids at the restaurant sitting at the restaurant with these guys throwing food at them and water and not fighting back. They got the right to vote. They got a little help from uh, LBJ, but it was civil disobedience that, that did it. Following his service in World War II, Sid returned to UMass to complete his bachelor's degree in physics. After landing a job with the Naval Research Laboratory, he was sent to University of California, Berkeley to get a master's degree and there he encountered a fervent political scene. And I went to school out there for a year. Got involved with a lot of uh, uh, quite liberal organizations because University of California at Berkeley was a fountainhead of provocative, avant-garde, political and moral thinking at that time. And that time it was the Trotskyites versus the Stalinists. There were th World Federalists that died out. These are people thought get rid of all the nations. During his time at Berkeley, Sid was offered a summer job at Raytheon Corporation back home in Massachusetts. As a student engineer, he was assigned to work on antenna technology, but when offered a full-time position, he asked for a transfer to the communication division. I made it clear to them that I did not work, want to work on military projects. Uh, I did design an, a radar antenna, uh, which was quite, I got a patent on it, but I said, I don't want to work on that. So I went back to my experience of microwave, and uh, I, uh, <coughs> I transferred out of the antenna branch of Raytheon to the communications department. I became a project engineer in something called a portable microwave link, which could, uh, say, be set up at Fenway Park on a tripod with a dish, and then a cable down to another box and connected to cameras, and so that you could do remotes, fires, burglaries, baseball. And I was a pioneer 
in electronic news gathering. I built the very first one. I, I built the microwave link between Mass General Hospital and Logan Airport. The key thing was that I was able to combine the audio and the color all together in one. That was a breakthrough. Nobody could do that. And it was very light, very portable. And we sold hundreds of those. It was a big commercial success for Raytheon. For 22 years, Sid worked for Raytheon, rising from engineering manager to general manager, before finally being appointed director of marketing and sales at Raytheon Europe under Carlo Colosi. The decision was made that we were going to set up operations. He wanted me to move. I came home, told Libby, we're moving to, uh, to Europe. She asked me, what are the plans? I had no idea. She cried. But she packed everything up, sold the house, sold the car, took the three kids, two, five, and seven, came to Europe. Six years later, after very successful Raytheon Europe days, where she was sculpting, had friends, kids went to school, had a driver, we had a maid, traveled. I got a, uh, an offer from my original boss to head up the communications division in Norwood, Mass. I agreed to do it. I came home, told Libby we're going home. She cried. In the late 1960s, Sid was offered a leadership position with a small technology company named Scientific Atlanta. At first, he turned the company down, but when he found himself at odds with the militaristic direction at Raytheon, he reconsidered. By that time, it was clear that I wasn't in the mainstream of Raytheon. I told you. By that time, the Hawk missile was booming. They were selling to Saudi Arabia, to the U.S., to Israel, to everybody. And I was in an area that was not very uh, mainstream in the company. In 1971, Sid became president, then CEO of Scientific Atlanta. He took the floundering company and turned it into a pioneering cable communications company. It was uh, into too many businesses, and I sold them off. And I uh, developed a uh, three-year plan and uh, used Hewlett Packard as my example of what a great company would be. Okay, high margins, product-oriented, recruit the best people, customer-oriented, community-oriented. Early in his career at Scientific Atlanta, Sid was approached by Chuck Dolan of HBO and later by Dolan's successor, Gerald Levin, to help the nascent cable company broadcast live sporting events across the country. In 1973, in Anaheim, California, they made their first attempt. So we take it out there with a live fight, 10 o'clock in New York, 7 p.m. in Anaheim, the Disneyland Hotel. People are coming in, cocktail party, coming up the stairs see this live fight, one guy knocks the other guy out in the first two minutes of the first round. But it was a very powerful thing. Two years later, the thriller from Manila, I have the only earth stations that can pick it up, and the rest is history. With Scientific Atlanta reaching new heights, Sid began to infuse his family's generous and progressive spirit into the company by sharing the benefits with both the company's employees and the greater Atlanta community. I got into Atlanta philanthropy right away. When I got there, we were probably giving like $100, you know, because it was a small company. We didn't have anything. It wasn't very profitable. It wasn't the interest. I was interested in community. I learned that from Hewlett Packard. I mean, David Packard and Bill Hewlett were great industrial leaders. Hewlett was the scientific guy, and Packard was the guy that went to the trade shows and talked to customers. Mm -hmm. but, but they had this theory of, of high margins. You know, develop products that you can sell that don't have to be price competitive, that people buy them because it helps them in their business, and they don't, it, it does so much in their business, helps them, that they're not going to quibble with you on price. So he priced it. But then he used the margins effectively. One of it was community activity, so as a model. So I started to get involved, as I told you, in these various things. And interesting enough, you don't have to give a lot of money. You just got to show up. 
and be active. Philanthropy and community involvement was an integral part of me being a CEO, right from the beginning. I thought I had not only obligations to the shareholders, but, but to the community. Coming out as a philanthropist was a gradual process for Sid. It began while he was still CEO at Scientific Atlanta. Working with community leaders like Mayor Andrew Young, he focused on building dialogue over issues of race and support for education and the arts. As a scientist, he, he's trained uh, to think about the future uh, and to plan for the future. And he has an amazing way of getting other people to see the future as he sees it. And he's willing to take the time with young people, with poor people, uh, to s help them to feel like they have a share in this future as well. So I proved myself as a, as a uh, successful CEO in, a, in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere of conservative other CEOs. So I got a respect. And so little by little, I started to come out a little bit. And it, it was the end of my career at, in Atlanta when I got to support Andy Young when he ran. I was a big supporter of Jimmy Carter. I sat in his box at, at the 1988 Democratic Convention. I was involved in the Democratic Convention. And by that time, I stopped worrying. Retiring from Scientific Atlanta, Sid returned to Boston with his wife Libby to an apartment in Boston's Back Bay neighborhood. Not content to take it easy, he claims that at first he flunked retirement really, really badly. Supporting movements for social change increasingly drew his interest, and he became actively involved in Democratic Party politics as a way of creating practical results to match his vision. I'm politically active in contributions to congressmen and senators. I was very, very active in the Deval Patrick campaign and, and, the, uh, and the Obama campaign. I met with him a number of times. If you meet with some of these people one-on-one -on -one where they're comfortable, I mean, there's no camera on them, you find really some really nice human beings. And, it, and uh, to, uh, both Duval and, and uh, Obama, saw, you know, and then the fact that finally as a nation, a person of color could be a governor or a senator or a president, I mean, that's, that's really exciting. Sid's practical vision for social change is deeply rooted and shared by his family. Well, it came from two people. It started with my mother and my wife. Uh, my wife was... Uh, married 63 years. Um, uh, I have one wife, one car, and one home. And three beautiful daughters and four beautiful grandchildren. Uh, my mother was always a very charitable person, always collecting nickels and dimes in those days. That's what the best you could do was collect nickels and dimes and maybe quarters. My wife was, was very good. She, uh, she worked in home counseling with dysfunctional families. Uh, she worked on uh, affordable housing, but always just kind of one-on-one. -on -one. My brother was very liberal, I would say quite left of center. And so he and I were very political and began to uh, become interested in uh, some of the socialist doctrines of from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, and so forth. My brother Julius Stoppel, a courageous fighter for civil and labor rights, he marched in Selma. So here he is talking to my older brother, who was a little more centrist, mm -hmm. but good Democrat, post-World War II, spent his time at Worcester, Mass., and he was honored by the Democratic Party of Worcester and was always a hard worker all his life. In Boston, Sid has continued philanthropic work with community groups and education. 
but throughout his life he's found himself in the right place at the right time. Through his philanthropy, he has been involved in international efforts relating to the conflict in Israel and Palestine, and more recently in efforts to study and apply nonviolent approaches to social change. And I, uh, I was fortunate to meet this lovely professor, Dr. Linda Trope, who explained her work and explained uh, scholarly research that shows that nonviolence has been successful. And we all know how unsuccessful violence has been, notably the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, the Gaza War. It's not successful. Other than, I mean, all we did is kill a lot of people in the end. Making money, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you know what to do with it. Okay. As long as you don't just buy three boats and five cars and six homes. As long as when you climb the ladder, you don't pull the ladder up behind you. <laughs>